The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Monica. So we took a week off last week and caught up with each other about biophilia and sort of reset our goals for the podcast. But we are back this week with our guest interviews in a big way. Yes. Our guest today is Jackie Patterson, who is the Senior Director of the NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Prior to joining the NAACP, Jackie volunteered with the Peace Corps in Jamaica and held several positions in the public health organizations like ActionAid and IMA World Health, where she focused largely on gender justice. In her current role, Jackie works to address racial disparities in the environmental-based health outcomes and the effects of climate change. The work she's doing is so impactful, and I think that really comes across in the ways in which issues of race and public and planetary health are so deeply intertwined, which we'll learn today. And it's definitely something that sounds scary when you start to talk about it, but Jackie has some really common sense and beautiful ideas about how we can go about addressing all these intertwined issues. Gosh, you really do. So let's get to our interview with Jackie Patterson. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us today. Monica and I are so happy to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We're thrilled. There's so much you want to get to, but I guess, first of all, what we'd love to know and we want to share with our listeners is where you came from and how you ultimately wound up with this position at NAACP. Mm, thank you. I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. I was born to my mom came up to Chicago through the Great Migration um, from Dublin, Mississippi. And my dad also immigrated to Chicago from Jamaica, West Indies. So I was uh, raised in um, in a household that really was a blending of cultures. And uh, and so that was definitely a critical part of my formation. Um, Yeah, from there, I I did work on um, on special education and then went on to do work, including going to the Peace Corps in Jamaica, which was interesting because they placed me in Jamaica specifically because I guess it's an area where a lot of Peace Corps volunteers end up leaving early. And so mm-hmm. they thought since I was Jamaican, then I would be able to stick it out. So, I, <laughs> um, and there I did special education and started to do some gender justice work when I was there. I helped to found fa- founded a group um, that was a chapter of the Association of Women in Development, and mm-hmm. um, and so that was uh, the beginning of my gender justice work. So fast forward ahead. Um, did work on um, went from from special education to doing work on public health, and then always with this thread around gender justice still, and um, ended up working at an international organization um, doing public health, and then another international organization doing human rights work around the intersection mm. of gender justice and macro finance, food security, and climate change. And so that was the first time that I actually started to formally do work around climate change in that, and from there was when I joined the NAACP in 2009 and um, working on climate change. And at that point, I, I mean, I hadn't really, I did you know, two, two, uh, two credit course in like a required course on environmental health and public health school. But other than that, um, I had done a couple of, of a special, I mean, of uh, environmental type, you know, because when I was in Peace Corps, the, the place that I lived in actually had its um, water supply contaminated by shell oil. And so that was Ugh. my first real experience with environmental justice or injustice. Mm. And um, and then after I finished doing the work at the end of my five year stint doing the public health work was Hurricane Katrina. And I ended up going down 
to um, to Houston and and volunteering in a disaster recovery center for six weeks. So that was another kind of direct connection with um, with environmental justice. But my training and my work hadn't really been consistently in environmental justice. So when this opportunity came at the NACP, I thought. You know, I'm not really like to be a director of a program around climate change when I really only kind of did these episodic um, engagements with sure. climate. I thought it sounded a little bit, you know, I felt a little underqualified. But then once I started doing it, it became clear that it, it actually was a strength because one of the challenges in terms of the NACP communities not necessarily seeing this environmental climate change in particular as their work was because people who are environmentalists, like kind of zealot, you know, mm-hmm. uh, died in the world environmentalists, weren't really talking their language, weren't really talking about their the reality of their communities uh-huh. and of our communities. And so from me coming in with a, with a similar kind of um, newness um, was, was really helpful in terms of really meeting people where they are mm-hmm. and really helping to kind of talk about the real issues that we're encountering every day and, and hearing what people are saying about their experiences and begin to weave that narrative around the intersectionality of and of climate change and environmental issues and the lived experiences of our communities. Mm-hmm. So that has been what has, and it, it even, you know, and, and, the, and that has been what has made it so um, gratifying to do the work because it felt like it was in the sweet spot of my purpose and my kind of uh, capabilities and, mm. and also my kind of strengths um, and being able to do that and why after 11 years, it has been so, um, it has grown and, and been so gratifying um, all along the way. So long answer to a short question. <laughs> but that brought us to where we are today. No, it's fantastic. Well, and, and I think that a lot of people, well, I'll speak for myself, like, you know, um, you know, really understanding climate and health and justice Mm -hmm. are so intertwined, but I feel like perhaps they've been siloed, you know, pre in the years past. And so, you know, um, obviously a lot of things over the past, you know, year to three years have brought it front and center and brought them together. But I, I think that that's interesting too. So of the time that you've been there and doing this work, have you seen that shift? Because you probably have had to educate people of how they're connected. Um, and sometimes <clears throat> we don't really recognize that, um, you know, environmental justice is a civil rights issue, right? And so tell me a little bit about like that continuum of how you've sort of moved people into that understanding. And obviously we have a lot of work to do still, but talk to me a little bit about that. Cause I think that's super important. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because uh, as we know the quote from Audre Lorde, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. <laughs> yep. And uh, that yep. has been so evident from the time that I began working with communities and because of, you know, kind of the nonprofit industrial complex, so to speak. And mm-hmm. There has been a a false siloing of these very, mm-hmm. very interconnected issues. And so for me, in some ways, it hasn't necessarily been having to educate as it relates to our communities around that because it is their lives. But in some ways, I've had to kind of deconstruct mm-hmm. our you know, some of the the ways that the nonprofit industrial complex has has uh, has uh, indoctrinated these false separations. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when we're having conversations, then the intersections automatically unfold when people talk about these things. And then it's it's, it's helping to kind of reintegrate like the language and the narrative so that that's what comes through in um you know, what comes through as we tell our stories. And so, mm-hmm. so one of the, so both in terms of the, the intersectional impacts, as well as the, the intersectional solutions, um, mm-hmm. there's a group called Climate Interactive that always uses this term, um, multi-solving. And, mm-hmm. um, and that has been so critical to, to helping communities to see that, uh, it's not a matter of kind of taking on another issue. It's a matter of, of developing solutions that are going to address these issues at their root. And so, 
So yes, to to some degree of kind of education and 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 but and also really kind of dismantling and and re um, kind of reestablishing a, a narrative that that really reflects the lived experiences has been what a lot of that work has been. And then externally, definitely having to do education around these intersections. So whenever I like, it's very fascinating to see the light bulb go off whenever I'm doing a talk or having a conversation. And, and I, there's one particular example that I give around, um, I talk about kids who are in communities that are in the in the shadows of these smokestacks mm -hmm. and how they are, you know, having, you know, they're ingesting lead and sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide, which is um, interfering with everything from their ability to go to school because of, you know, asthma and, and missed days of school to their ability to, to learn when they're in school because mm -hmm. lead and manganese affects um, attention and, and, and cognitive um, uh, functioning to their, um, and then the ways that uh, the intersection, intersecting with that is not just the smokestacks, but also the near roadway air pollution, which is another <laughs> source of pollution for the community. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, all these very safe communities are often the ones that don't have access to healthy and nutritious foods because mm -hmm. of, you know, the food insecurity in those communities, which again, uh, you know, impairs functioning in school. And then on top of it all, again, that we know um, for Black kids, for example, that an African-American family making $50,000 a late year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making $10,000 a year, according to Dr. Robert Bullard's um, research. And that if you're living next to a toxic facility, then um, your property values on average are at least 15% lower. And we also know that property values are um, are are our, what finances our school system. So you mm -hmm. have kids who aren't able to go to school. Um, it's the same as other kids in terms of these asthma rates with African-American children being three to five times more likely to enter the hospital from an asthma attack and two to three times more likely to die from an asthma attack. And then we have kids who are, when they're in school, they're having a hard time paying attention. And then you have under-resourced schools so that they're not even at the same quality of education mm -hmm. and resources in the school. And then we talk about how if you're not on grade level by the third grade, that studies show that you're more likely to enter into the school to prison pipeline. Yeah. So these are the types of intersections that I then have to explain to other other um, other people to get, whereas the the communities are living these realities every day. Mm -hmm. um, but even even in even while living the realities you know, the whole kind of can't see the forest for the trees. Sometimes it's not like you're living the reality, but you don't necessarily see the depth of the systemic um, impacts. It just is what it is. Like, this is just our lives. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily compared to someone else because you don't really realize that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, the idea that you just mentioned that, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us have heard that, you know, um, you know, zip codes or, you know, poverty are a lot of the reasons why, um, you know, they're sort of like it's a disenfranchised group that has been didn't have really a voice or didn't really understand that this whatever shell or I don't, not to, you know, but anyway, we will you know, oil companies are not great, you know, these big corporations that are doing downstream, you know, releases and, you know, they didn't really have a voice, but I think it's interesting that you're saying that it's, it's more than class, it's mm -hmm. race, right. which is even, which is even worse. Right. And so, um, you know, but you talk about so many things, right. And so a lot of people are just like, I don't know what to do. You're mm -hmm. giving me way too Where many. To like <laughs> one of those one of those things is is like how can I help? But mm -hmm. now I'm like a little bit paralyzed. How what is the NAACP like how are they, you know, or, or like working towards sort of um figuring out how to change the system and or unpack some of these issues because, you know, just education mm -hmm. Is, is a hot topic. And I think it's super important one that you brought up. Um, but I think that the climate change is just this threat multiplier of it makes it all worse, right? You, you could have been in that situation. And now we have a hurricane that rolls through. And we've destroyed, you know, everything on top of all these systematic issues that are there. So, so how do we how do we start? Where do we start? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know if there, there's really one place, but 
tell us like as a, as a listener, like, okay, we got a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. what, can we, what can we do to start unpacking this? So one thing, like often I get asked a question about kind of what's one thing that can be done. And, um, and of course, like you said, uh, there's so many things that, that need to be done. Mm -hmm. One critical start is getting money out of politics, campaign finance reform, <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, so many of the interests that want to maintain the status quo mm -hmm. are um, are the ones that are resulting in the lack of you know public health, environmental um, protections, and so forth, and and, mm -hmm. and really pushing this agenda. So that's that's one thing that we have to do. Like we all have to kind of coalesce around. Um, but otherwise, I uh, back in 2015, I wrote this thing. Um, 15 thing, or maybe 20 things you can do to advance a sustainable planet. Recognize. Okay. That you know that everybody needs to have their own entry point to get in and do what needs to be done, and everybody can do something. You know, mm -hmm. whether yep. it's starting a conversation at dinner, um, you know that you know that then leads to something. You just never know what will what spark um, will will make change, or whether it is beginning to grow your own. I, I during the pandemic, I had grew this whole flourishing balcony garden on my tiny condo balcony. <laughs> where I grew my Love own it. tomatoes and peppers and onions and, you know, various herbs and so forth. And then, you know, just doing that and taking one trip, one trip to the grocery store off or, the, or many trips to the grocery mm -hmm. store off of my agenda or, or those trucks that would have otherwise trucked those things into, mm -hmm. you know, like, so just beginning to one by one shift that system, a um, mm -hmm. food system that is contributing to, um, not only kind of the the dis the 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 unhealthiness in our communities, but also contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions and other uh, pollutants that that charge our um, our atmosphere. And so, so so I talk about all these different things you can do, from the very small to things like running, you know, uh, supporting political campaigns or running for office oneself and being educated and informed as you serve in office. Mm -hmm. Just starting a community, a community, you know, you know, whether it's your own tiny balcony garden or it's starting a community co-op or whether it's your own, you know, energy efficient, being more energy efficient in your home or starting a community solar microgrid. So like, mm -hmm. like wherever you can get in and start mm -hmm. doing all these things that need to be done is is a step in the right direction and there's people who can do it at scale and there's people who can do it at the individual level but the 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 key is that we all need to be doing something in the right direction so that's what i say when people get too overwhelmed um and then also these like once you start doing one thing it becomes an entry point for them to start to do more um but just kind of do what's digestible and doable in that moment. And then keep thinking about how do you challenge yourself to, to scale up from an individual level and, and so forth. Yeah. I like how you did that. You found your purpose, your capabilities and your strengths, and you sort of came together. Like um, I think it was Catherine Wilkerson who, you know, um, you wrote part of the anthology of all we can save. I think that what we interviewed her, not on this podcast, but another one about, um, you know, kind of finding your superpower. Mm -hmm. which I think is a really wonderful way to sort of think about um, what can I do, mm -hmm. you know, cause it has to be personal, right? Absolutely. But tell me a little bit about um, the essay that you wrote. Um, it was an amazing essay. And, and for me, just like even thinking about what you can do, you know, for us here on Biophilic Solutions, one of our big things is awareness, right? How can we share stories and ideas with people that have ideally scalable solutions, right? So what would you tell people who are struggling or feeling paralyzed? In your work, you tackle so many issues and such intense inequity that I wonder if you ever encounter people who just freeze because they don't know how to deal with it or where to start. How do you, how do you begin to tackle those inequities and then tackle how people respond? Yeah. Um, so I don't remember what all I said in the essay. So I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll just um, maybe just give a couple of examples. Of, exactly. Yeah. So. And so, one of the things that it was, was in there is about Jamaica. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, how, um, you know, with extreme weather, and that was, I think it was Hurricane Gilbert, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just these examples of how, again, the climate, um, the climate change that is here, and that is only going to get increasingly, um, I guess, worse, um, you know, how do we um, maybe it's even try start to um, plan better for this. Mm-hmm. Um, so anything you want to talk about in that area, I would love, you know, just sort of the, what are those sort of examples that yeah. the good has come out of these things, you know, yeah, learned. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I will just say, in terms of, I mean, so, all right. So, so I think everything you say kind of makes me, every time I think I'm going to say something, then you say something that makes me think. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of going back to your original question about inequities, and then maybe I'll talk about the good. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so in terms of inequities, um, I mean, one of the things that we talk about is as we, as we examine kind of the, the 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 systemic underpinnings of the extreme disparities um, they really start from the founding like when we talk about in the United States the founding of this nation you know there's mm-hmm. kind of a lot of like romanticizing of the of the founding fathers and mm-hmm. and the you know forefathers and all these kind of things all the fathers but um but but we know that um that unfortunately the very kind of principles and practices of extraction exploitation domination Mm -hmm. that were at the very core of how the, the what has become known as the united states of america came into being have been just uh, made more sophisticated um, to some extent over time, but it's the same kind of core practices of extractivism, exploitation, domination. Mm -hmm. And until we faced that and and really uh, address that as kind of core operational principles mm-hmm. that we're going to so whether so whether it is the 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 pandemic and the ways that we saw that play out even in the pandemic to uh to climate change to the economic crisis to the racial awakening i mean it still has that same rot at the core and until we kind of address that rot we're not going to to be able to make true progress yeah. um, so I know, uh, and I know that that can even seem overwhelming. And, and at the same time, at the same time, we see hope in like the mutual aid that we see that we see in the context of the pandemic. The 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 the, the random acts of of kindness and connection that we hear about every day, all day. So that that the rot and the perpetuation of and the and the kind of enclosure and protection of that rot is really in some ways being done by a very finite few and then there's the rest of us <laughs> that mm-hmm. that are really operating in love and altruism and then there's the folks who um who have allowed themselves to be corrupted by the manipulations of the folks who want to protect the rot. <laughs> and um, and those are the folks who are acting on on fear. So mm-hmm. this is where you see like the folks who were the, the white nationalists who have become Black Lives Matter activists. So they, when they were white nationalists, it's not like they were just evil people at their core who were just out to, there were people who didn't understand and who were who were led down the wrong path mm-hmm. and, and led down this path of notion of scarcity and and then feeling fear, feeling threatened, and reacting in that in that way mm-hmm. to that fear and to that false narrative, and so 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 really, it, in some ways, it's it's simple, and that's why I kind of go back to getting money out of politics because yeah. we have to we have to get the the rot protectors out of power, <laughs> yeah, know? and that yeah. that's that's really at the very essence of it, and so. 
Um, and so I think all of us, you know, not all of us, like the 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 ninety nine percent who would love, you know, would love to see the the you know protection of 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 our um, natural resources. The ninety nine percent would love to see us all be able to have enough to eat, to have enough to, you know, have clean water to drink, have clean air and so forth. So it really is a matter of us kind of understanding that, understanding mm -hmm. what's manipulating the system, mm -hmm. coming together to get to, to dismantle, um, dismantle the, the system that, you know, that capitalizes and that oppresses and and really embraces the the abundance that we know we have in our society there's you know the sun rises every day the wind blows like we have enough we have yeah. enough you know we have a regenerative um earth systems that that create more than enough that we need and what we need is for everyone to understand that embrace that and for us to, to develop our systems around that instead of our systems around kind of enclosure of wealth and power and, and you know in the hands of a finite few so that's kind of my meta analysis, but um, <laughs> um, um, oh, I love that. I think of what you're doing really is your work is all about our connectivity to nature, right? So we're mm -hmm. all in harmony with nature when we really understand the systems of how we thrive together and how we suffer when we when we're separate. And right. I think like you even just talking like how do we start? It's like the simple act of instead of going to the grocery store to get food and all that happens to that time frame, why don't we build a garden in our, you know, I try and do that. I live in New York city. So it's really hard to do that outside my window on the 11th floor, mm. but it's like simple little acts that we can do that make a difference from understanding how food is grown, how yes. soil is made, how we become stronger together in harmony, like with nature. Mm -hmm. And that um, that's where we thrive. That's where there's a symbioticness mm -hmm. of ourselves and nature and how we thrive. Like that's where we learn inclusivity. That's where mm -hmm. we learn diversity is, we you know, we're all like, when you look at the trees and the plants around us, you think how, how do they all thrive together? It's because we're all working in unison. Right. Yes. So I, I think the bottom of your work is all about, those teachings, right? It's mm -hmm. it's really beautiful. And it's so once you get to those little underpinnings of underpinnings of what you're doing, it's like that's that's it, right? Mm -hmm. It's true. The beauty of it all. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I think I think again that we have enough, right? Mm -hmm. But there is this you know, false narrative and fear that wants us to hold and extract. And um, instead of understanding that um, it's sort of this sharing, hopeful, mm -hmm. um, which again, like, I think there was just a, I mean, I think there's been a bunch of um, books on trees and how, you know, they speak to each other through the roots and the mushrooms and, and sort of that co um, living, if you will, mm -hmm. is a great example. I feel like there was something mm -hmm. just recently in like the New York times, but like, you know, maybe we need to take a, you know, take a lesson from the trees and how, you know, when one isn't doing well, it helps out the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're right. The humanity that we saw through the devastation of COVID was was really beautiful mm -hmm. of people helping out each other. Um, and that is true. The The majority is that way. And, you know, sometimes, um, I wouldn't say sometimes, but you know, the, the powers that be, or, you know, the people who want to keep the rock going and, and hold on to that, um, wealth and power in a negative way, they're the ones instilling the fear in us because they want to divide us mm -hmm. right? because if we're <laughs> divided, we're, we're not going to come together and demand, um, reform, you know, in camp campaign, finance, fan ugh campaign finance <laughs> reform, mm -hmm. um, you know, because if we're fighting over resources or whatever it is, um, jobs, you know, then we're not going to come together again. And so I just think you're so right that, I mean, Jennifer, too, this like nature is, we always say nature has the answers. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have some places that you like to send people to engage in sort of um, thinking about camp campaign finance reform? Is there an organization you would pick? point people towards like is the NAACP doing work where can we because I, I do like that that is sort of um obviously you know there's a ton of stuff we can do but I like that you went to sort of the heart of it like that actually is a systematic problem mm -hmm. 
definitely. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, one group that's doing work around the whole Citizens United and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was is moved to amend. So I would definitely point mm. people there. Um, there's also all the groups that are involved in groups like the Democracy Collaborative, the Democracy Initiative that are doing a lot on campaign financial reform. Mm-hmm. Um, those are ones that come readily off of the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we'll definitely put those in the show notes. I, I think that that is something that we can do. I mean, a huge part of it, and it'll be interesting to see as we move into the next election cycle, you know, there were so many more people who were engaged in this mm-hmm. past election. Um, so so how do we continue to get people to be engaged? Right? right. And, and not in a, you know, you should vote for this person or that person, but truly just educate yourself. Yeah. What are the issues in your neighborhood? Yeah. You know, so that could be a city council member or a school board, yes. you know, that, how do you, and then I, and I love the, um, the run for something, mm-hmm. you know, group, um, because I think that's super important as well is that again, no person is too small to do something. In fact, you have a quote, I think it's you, that everybody doesn't have to do everything, but everybody needs to do something. Yeah. It's a great one. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> you crystallize it for me, you know? Um, well, tell us as we're getting sort of to the end of the conversation here, you know, what else do we want it? Should we know and really be thinking about um, and support the work that you're doing? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would definitely point people to, and I can send the link to the 20 things you can do to advance. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that that gives people uh, entry points. And and each of the things has links to to follow to say how they can do it. So I would definitely say that. Um, I would also say that to the extent that, that, that people can join and be a member of like a local, whether it's environmental justice group or or otherwise, that would be great um, to just get behind and support the leadership of frontline communities. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, when it comes to address to advancing racial justice and environmental issues or otherwise, if if for people who are who are allies to racial justice efforts, I would Mm -hmm. would point people to showing up for racial justice, the Mm -hmm. certain groups in one's community. And so whether you you have one in your community, you can join or Mm -hmm. you can start one and you'd be a part of a network of folks. You would have those resources. You wouldn't, so you wouldn't have to kind of start in and be like kind of just kind of struggling in the trenches. But as soon as you decide to start one, you're a Mm -hmm. part of like this network of folks who will then kind of walk you through how to do it. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, Because that's it as well. Right. You know, again, people, I think people are good and people want to do something and they don't know what to do and they don't know where to start. And so, again, we're trying to give people the tools, like hopefully some of these conversations spark an interest or like, oh, I could help with that. Um, And so I love that. The showing up for racial justice. Great. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely put that in the show notes as well. Um, Well, tell us uh, last question, like what's next? What do mm-hmm. you guys, you know, I'm sure you're going to be super involved in the the next election cycle. I think the money out of politics is a really, really good conversation and push. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything else we can do? Should we join the NAACP, become a member? Can we donate? Like what's the, you know, support structure that we can also do there? Yeah, joining would be fantastic. Absolutely joining, particularly if one can join one's local unit um or which is branches or chapters mm-hmm. um if you joined and then started an environmental and climate justice committee if there isn't already one that okay. would be great <laughs> and again like with surge you would automatically be connected into this nationwide network of environmental and climate justice committees and there's all of these kind of toolkits and guidance documents and so forth so it wouldn't have to be like this again tough i love slide. that <laughs> yeah so we would love to have that and all are welcome. Um, and yeah, we are with the work of the environmental and climate justice uh, program. It's everything from, from, you know, because of the intersectionality, it's everything mm-hmm. from advancing local food work to, to, uh, 
to ending the fossil fuels, to uh, pushing for pushing back against water privatization and pushing for public water systems, mm-hmm. to advancing disaster equity, to addressing issues around sea level rise, to pushing for land justice and housing security because it's mm-hmm. a critical part of climate resilience. We also have a centering equity in the sustainable building sector initiative, which really pushes for our buildings to, as we talked about before, to model like to to follow the models of of biomimicry and Mm -hmm. really have all of your buildings be in regenerative design and again Mm -hmm. um and with a goal of as you said as well like our all of our systems um following biomimicry (laughs) because um really the regenerative cooperative ways that our ecology at its root has been you know operates Mm -hmm. is the way that we that Mm we um that we navigate all of the and avoid the eruption of new crises and navigate our existing crises um, mm-hmm. towards kind of not just surviving but actually thriving. Um, yeah. Across species. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's so right, right? Exactly. Biomimicry is the way that we have to right, follow how we, we survive and thrive and, and, and really grow together in harmony. So. But thank you, Jackie. Thank you for your time guys. today. I feel Thanks like for being I a part of this conversation and helping us <laughs> share your, your story and your wealth of information and is not the answer time you spent to you. But it really um, makes so much us. sense. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of and public we're excited to have you part of the like biofilm system. Systemic racism, yes. Yes. poverty, <laughs> and climate. <laughs> but we have All to get special interest as a political structure in order to really start doing that. And just like Jackie said, there is really a very finite group of people who are protecting the status quo. And if we recognize that there are plenty of resources for all of us to share for abundance, then we can really start to take back that power. Absolutely. And for anyone who is struck by that answer about campaign finance reform, we've linked to the two organizations that Jackie mentioned in our show notes. So it'll be really easy to find out. You know, I also think it bears repeating that if anyone who's listening to this walks away and does something to start growing your own vegetables to get connected to the food system, donating some extra dollars to the NAACP or you know you should join their local SURJ chapter those things feel maybe small but when they're replicated hundreds or thousands of times across everyone you know they really do have massive impact so then you and I you and I are you and me anyway we don't have to bear the entire weight of a movement on our shoulders you know if we tell ourselves that it's too hard or too complicated to even get started Exactly. I think Jackie said it best. I love this. Everybody doesn't have to do everything, but everybody needs to do just something. Exactly. I couldn't agree. All right. Until next time, Jennifer. Bye, Monica. 